Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my channel, Runaway Slave. This channel was created to promote my self-published masterpiece, The N-Word is No Secret in the Service. I wrote this book after I spent over 10 years as an officer in the United States Secret Service. During this time, I learned what true foundational institutionalized or systemic workplace racism is and how it affects my people. If you would like to purchase this masterpiece, just click the link down in the description. If you enjoy the content and would like to support the channel, please continue to like, share, and subscribe. In addition, if you would like to make a donation, we do have a cash app, which is dollar sign runaway slave 609. Okay, let's cook. So, people, today we're going to talk about disparities and emergency care. You know, the EMT, the ambulance the rescue squad, the disparities in emergency care. So disparities in healthcare are very well documented. Now, what this means is simply white people tend to get better care and experience and better outcome when they go into the doctor's office, the emergency room, or any health related field service, okay? That's just the bottom line. That's just the way it is. If you are a conscious black person with full access to your humanity, you understand that this is the bottom line. You live through it, you feel it. Now, if you happen to be a black person who, who thought you always had great outcomes when you went and, and received medical care, you went to the hospital, you went to emergency room, oh, they're so nice. They did this for me. Well, you may think differently if you knew what kind of treatment white people were getting. You won't know your treatment that you're getting is more than likely subpar or unsatisfactory unless you see what kind of treatment white people are getting. But for most black people and anything, and especially when we're getting this type of care, we've already accepted, you know, the treatment that we get as the norm, it is what it is. This is what we used to. We don't know any different. You know what I mean? So it gets deeper than just the hospital and the emergency room, people. There was a recent, stu a recent study, right, that brings light to the disparities in emergency care. This means the ambulance, the EMT, the medical first responders. We always talk about the hospitals. We talk about the clinics and things like that. But seldom do we talk about the ambulance. And that EMT and in that ambulance or that emergency care, when that when that car, when that van comes to get you, that box van, it's a very vulnerable position for a black person to be in. Very vulnerable. Now, there were some studies done. There were some studies done, people. This person here, his name is Jamie Kim Kennel. I'm sorry, Jamie Kennel. Jamie Kennel is the head of the emergency medical service programs at Oregon State University and the Oregon Institute of Technology. Now, this guy, Jamie, Jamie led a research team that did a study. They did a study and the results to this study were presented at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Scientific Symposium in Orlando, Florida. What was the bottom line to this study? I'd like to get straight to the point. The bottom line result to this study was that the ambulance, the EMTs, paramedics, emergency response have issues with racism and how they treat black patients. It makes sense to me because this is really this is a white male dominated field. Most of the time when you see these EMTs or people, they're usually white males. Now, there are two factors that play a role in this subpar treatment of black people who need a paramedic or EMT. These two factors are unconscious bias and the other is just outright hardcore racism and hate. Just it is what it is. Unconscious bias, people. Something that most Caucasian Americans deal with. OK, now let's talk about unconscious bias in this situation. Now, in this situation, when we talk about emergency care, the unconscious bias comes into effect any time that white people are responsible for the care or protection or the assistance of black people. This could be a medical worker, it could be a police officer, it could be a teacher at a school, anything to name a few. You know what I mean, I've talked about unconscious bias 
in law enforcement, when you see certain things going on with police officers, the way they move, the way they react to black people, it's because of how they think and how they feel. You know what I'm saying? The person, whether it be a medical person, a teacher, a police officer sometimes, that person may not be a hardcore, outright, overt, hardcore white supremacist. They may even sometimes generally be a good person, but the unconscious bias that has been built up in them just from being a white person in America, from watching TV, going to school, media, watching sports, this unconscious bias is deeply embedded in most white Americans. And it produces a white American superiority complex. And in addition, you know, a form of racism. The unconscious bias does manifest in the medical field, right? And the study by this man who I'm talking about, Kennel, proves it. It proves it. And it's very obvious when black people get into the ambulance. It's a very spooky experience because for black people or anybody in general, the ambulance or the EMT is a exigent circumstance. This is something where when you when you get into that ambulance and that EMT, you're just hoping that your people get to the hospital and it's OK. You know what I mean? Maybe you rush to the hospital or whatever. They might have you hop back in there with them. You know what I mean? But most of the time they're by themselves and their self. Right. And, and, and we don't think about the treatment that they getting back there because we're just thinking this such and such almost passed out or he passed out. She passed out. He or she almost died. Get them to the hospital. But when they end these EMTs and these back of these ambulances and these trucks, what's going on? We're pretty much sitting ducks in these in these trucks, yo. Very vulnerable. And we're usually at the mercy of a white EMT's personal feelings or beliefs. They could do pretty much anything they want to do when we in there, y'all. And it's a scary thing to think about. It's a scary thing to think about. Because a medical person can do whatever they want to do to you and get away with it, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to spend. Very easy to spend. I mean, many of your people have died at the hands of something that a medical... I mean, it's sad, sad to say, and it's a spooky thing. Many of our people went to the hospital and they just said, you know what, let me go ahead. You know what I mean? Let me take this person out today. That's just the way it is. Especially when we don't know anything and we go in for things that we shouldn't even have to go there for. You know what I mean? Now, here's a Caucasian EMT by the name of Jason Dark, right? Jason Dark, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the last name right. Now, this young white man, I would think that he was one of the, he's one of the good people, based off of what he says, that wants to do their job, save lives, get people to where they need to get, give people the proper treatment that they need. So he's one of the good people. He says... That race doesn't affect the treatment that he gives. He said race doesn't affect the treatment that he gives. But he also said that him and his co-workers often think about unconscious bias. And he said that he works hard to be aware of it and not let it affect his care. This is what else he said. This is what he said. This, this white boy right here, Jason Duff, this white man. Historically, historically, it's the way the country has been. In the beginning, we had slavery, Jim Crow, and red line, and all that stuff, and you get lost in, on a large macro scale. He said, yes, it's there, which is unconscious bias in medical EMT care. This is what he said. This is a white man. Listen to what he's saying. So this is a white man who interacts with EMTs. He's been in the medical field. He's been around hundreds and hundreds of EMTs. He knows a lot. And he says he always has to be concerned about unconscious bias. Listen to what he's saying. He says, yes, it's there. Is he lying? Right, people, why it always got to be about race? Right, always got to be about race, right? Ask the people who made it like that. This young man, Jason Dalk, he's an EMT. Again, like I said, he seems to be, from what he says, one of the ones who seems like he wants to do his job. 
So this is a white man actually admitted. He admitted more than I can get a lot of my own people to admit. We all know about slavery, but he had enough, enough respect, right? He had enough respect to mention the Jim Crow era and redlining, which is, he said this, this white boy, Jason Duck, the EMT. And then we can add on many more that a lot of people don't talk about. We can add on the crack era. You know, we can add on the emasculation of black man era. And it's, it's so many more. It's so many more. The followers on his channel, you smart. You know, you know about more of these errors, you know. But this white man, Jason Duck, was actually honest. And he said that he works hard to be aware of this unconscious bias. And he doesn't want it to affect the treatment that he gives people. So what he's saying is this bias is, is so deeply embedded in white Americans that they literally have to stop and think and drill and work it out, mentally drill themselves not to give black people subpar treatment due to unconscious bias. And he's being honest. And any white person that says, I don't see race, I treat all people equal, and they don't admit that they have to constantly remind themselves to treat people, to treat black people the same, these are the, usually the ones who are, who, who, who are lying, you know? And these are the ones who are usually giving black people subpar medical treatment or subpar treatment on any service that we may need. This, this white man here, Jason Dawk, is telling the truth. As a white American, he's saying he has to constantly remind himself. Him and his co-workers have talked about this. He's keeping it real. And he had enough respect to bring up Jim Crow and redlining. Something that a lot of times I can't even get my own people to discuss. But again, I'm not comparing him to my people. Something different has been done to my people. Okay? It's, 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 it's a lot of mental illness that was caused by the government, you know, and these many different eras of oppression. Anyway, for these white people who say that I don't see race, I treat, they're lying. They're lying. Because there is a guy right here who's responsible for saving black people's lives and rendering aid. And he sounds like somebody who wants to do his job and he kept it all the way true. Listen to what this study, right, that they did. Listen to what Jamie Kennel found out in these studies, people. Listen to what he found out. He says the false stereotypes about race-based differences in physiology that date back to slavery also play a role in the healthcare disparities right now. So he's saying another white man who conducted this study, the false stereotypes about race-based Differences in physiology that date back to slavery. So people say, oh, slavery was such and such years ago. But clearly you have the studies and the research to prove that these things affect what's going on to this day and now. He says, for example, despite a lack of any supporting sign, which science, which means they don't have any science to support this. Some medical professionals still think that the blood of African-Americans coagulates faster than white people. So coagulates means it changes from a, uh, to a solid state or a semi-solid solid state from being liquid, which basically would mean they believe that our blood clots faster to heal wounds, therefore we recover faster. Another question in this survey asked these same students. These are medical students. These are medical professionals who are still in school. It asked them whether they thought African-Americans have fewer pain receptors than whites. And he said uncomfortably large and uncomfortably large percentage of medical students said, yes, this is true. These are the people who are going to go out <laughs> and be the doctors. This is what they said. Again, with a lack of any supporting science evidence. This is what the majority of them believe, that we heal faster, our blood coagulates faster, meaning that it clots so that it heals wounds faster, and that we have fewer pain receptors. And that comes from slavery, y'all. So these doctors who are in training now, or these medical professionals who are in training now, right, they're in school. This is what they, the mindset from slavery or the, the things that they got from slavery 
or they, they believe that has no supporting, you know, supporting medical uh, or scientific backing, they, they still believe this. And these are the people that are going to go to the hospital or going to be in that emergency room. This is the way they're trained to think, y'all. This is, these are, this is a white man. This is a study conducted by a white, not by somebody like me. So, people, when you go to the hospitals, you go to these emergency rooms, and you see all your people screwed up sometimes, looking uncomfortable or in a painful position, and you're just looking like, you, you, you're like, yo, do something. This, this don't look right. Like, yo, why my people, why they, why they like that? Sometimes, yo, you're right. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes they leave your people's there screwed up like this because deep down inside, this medical professional may believe that you could take pain a little bit more. You are right. You, you know how it be. You go to you're like, hold up. This don't look like we can't express. A lot of times we can't express ourselves medically. But what we see like, OK, yo, like, I can't explain this. But yo, this don't look right. A lot of times you're right. A lot of times you're right, yo. Listen to one of our peoples here by the name of Lisa Gregory. Listen to one of our peoples here by the name of Lisa Gregory, right? Lisa Gregory is one of the very few black female emergency medical technicians in a place called Lenawe County, Michigan. I may have pronounced that wrong. And she says the findings to these studies are true. She's a physician assistant now. She says that the study's findings are true. What they're saying as far as unconscious bias and the other things they found out about what these medical people may think. She said she remembers one particular call where a patient was down in pain. She's an EMT. She arrives on the scene and she could see that this patient was black. And that's and, and, and as she's there, one of her colleagues, right, a white colleague grown and grown like, oh, man, you know, and, and she said this white colleague said something like, oh, God, here we go again. One of them type comments. You know how it is. She says now when she heard that and she seen what they were going into, she was worried because the patient's black. And. This white colleague of hers was assuming that this this black patient was acting out in order to get more pain drug. Basically, you 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 don't need this much pain medication. You just want to get high. Right. So this is where her colleague is assuming. And she says she's absolutely sure that this colleague response was unconscious bias. So it's something that you know what I mean? That they automatically, it's, it's deep in them. They're not even, it's like, boom, it's like blinking your eyes or chewing your food. You know what I mean? Just imagine that. It's like, it's like somebody sticking your finger down your throat and, and stopping. You know what I'm saying? You're going to do certain things automatically. So she said at the time when she approached the situation, it increased her stress because she thought now she's going to have to fight her colleague to get more medical pain medication for this black person. She already thinking like, man, I'm going to have to fight this dude <sighs> trying to get this person some pain medication if they really, you know what I mean, tried to act funny or not treat this person for pain just because they black. And we know this position all too well. You know how it is when you're at work, especially if you work in something like the medical law enforcement you know, something like that. You done, yeah, the fire, a fire, you done been in these situations, yo, where you with, where you with a coworker or you around some coworker and you already know how these people think and you like, I'm gonna have to, shh. you just watching, like, yeah, you better, you better treat my people's all right. Like, you, you already know. And this person may have a reputation for even treating black coworkers better. So you already like, man, I'm gonna have to go ahead and say something. I'm gonna have to, damn, man. You know what I mean? Because you know how they're gonna treat your people's. She said, this is what the sister said, Lisa Gregory. And this is a, a result of this study as well. The research has found that African-Americans are more likely to be deeply distrustful, distrustful of the medical community, and that might play a role in diminished care as well. Lisa Gregory says this, this distrust is, is obviously is understandable, and it goes back many generations. She says, how can a person of color not disrespect a system that is constantly studying and talking about these disparities, but does nothing to fix it? Wow. Exactly my point, Lisa Gregory. This is what I've been saying. People like us, Lisa Gregory, what we've been saying about not just the medical field, a lot of different fields. We, we think alike. 
And what I think is going, this is what I, I can see. This, this is how these, these white supremacists, mainly these liberals, spin it. This is what they're doing. Because they're the ones, I'm not saying they're any better or worse than the other ones, but they're the ones who like to make this, you know, use, use our history and oppression to make money. So what they're doing is uh, these people, they just take our history and our current struggle or our current oppression and they use it for their own entertainment and case studies. Like, you know, they take it and they put it at these universities for these up and coming white people to study and do papers on and things like that. Or they make movies about it. They sit back and talk about it. And it's like, OK, do something about it. And it's for them. Doing something is so far from it. It's like just it's just strictly for entertainment and study. You know what I mean? It's just like it's an interesting topic. You know, let's look at this. It's almost like looking at a zoo animal or something. You know what I mean? For real. So I don't know if anybody ever seen the Washington Post. If you live in that area or maybe have read the Washington Post or line. The Washington Post, they do a, a series, right? called Democracy Dies in Darkness. And what this, this series does, it, it addresses issues that concern black people as far as history, racism, and things like that. It's called Democracy Dies in Darkness. Now, these stories that come out, they're just stories that these white people read, right? And they say, wow, did you see that? It's like entertainment. But when you look at it, it's like, okay, just like Lisa Gregory said, do something. The issue is here. Do something. But that doesn't cross their mind. They just get drawn to the entertainment and wow factor of it and the study factor, almost like they're looking at some zoo animals. That's why I don't believe in these, uh, you know, have a discussion or have to No, you, you already know what to do. You already know what to do. You know what I mean? So it's like it's almost like our struggle and our history has been turned into income for these white liberals. They act like they care. They act like they're fascinated and intrigued. They make documentaries about lynchings and they make documentaries about this, this and that. You see these people on these, you see them. But then they, they go and they meet with the family and they sit around and talk and they say, we're gonna have a get together. But they never press other white people to do anything. But they get money off of it. This is what Lisa Gregory is saying. You know what I mean? And she's relating that to the medical field. So this sister, Lisa Gregory, she went all out. She wrote a letter. She wrote an open letter to the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2015. And she asked them to declare racism a threat to public health. This is what this sister did. She wrote the letter. She said, declare racism a threat to public health because as somebody in the public health field, she sees this. Which is true. But of course, she got the okie doke response where they said racism is a social issue, which it is. And pretty much these people have infiltrated. This is racism is, is, is American, yo. It, it's American as apple pie, baseball and Chevrolet. But big up to Sister Lisa Gregory for having full access to her, her humanity. I don't know her, but she stood 10 toes down when she did this and she's talking some real stuff. Now, at the beginning of this video, right, I said that there were two factors in the medical field, the EMT, the emergency response, which lead to subpar care for black people. One of them was unbi uh, unconscious bias, which I just covered, the unconscious bias, and the other is just being a hardcore racist. Believe it or not, people, a lot of these EMTs or paramedics or people are hardcore racists and white supremacists. What do you think they doing in that back of the ambulance when your people's back there? These hardcore races, believe it or not, I'm not talking about the unconscious bias, whereas a white person may want to do their job, but it may manifest as subpar performance in them towards black people because of these deep rooted things that they feel that they've been motivated to believe. I'm talking about the hardcore racist ones who taking your peoples to the hospitals. Look at this. Look at this guy right here. Look at this kneecap forehead white supremacist bozo named Alex McNabb. This big kneecapped head knuckle dragon beast white supremacist EMT. Here's a guy who's, who's responsible for rendering care to many black people in exigent emergency circumstances. Right. He's an EMT. So this racist bonehead right here, even with his job, 
He was a frequent co-host on a white supremacist podcast. When he went on his podcast, he, he, he compared black patients to gorillas and even claimed to take immense satisfaction as he terrorized an African-American boy with a needle. He talked about an emergency call to which he characterized as a black apartment complex that the medics, him and his white buddies, call Ebola Alley, an apartment complex where, white, where black people live. They call it Ebola Alley. He even referred to a black woman as a shaved Harambe, or Harambe being the name of a famous gorilla. Yeah, that's what he, this is what he's calling a black woman. He even spoke of a time, this is what he's saying, that he had an unruly young African-American male, male little boy. He needed to have blood drawn. And he said he took great satisfaction as he terrorized his youngster with a needle and stabbed him in one arm with a large catheter. This is, this is an EMT. Look at this kneecap head, dude. This is what he's saying. He even talks about, tells a story about a diabetic ER patient and a doctor in the ER who collects toenails. So this guy's department, they, they, they started to investigate McNabb after receiving anom anonymous complaints about him using racist and anti-Semitic rhetoric on social media. These complaints expressed concerns that, could, that he could be harming or mistreating people of color in his line of duty. Of course he will, of course they do. What you think they doing to your peoples in the back of the ambulance, yo? This dude, McNabb, said it is his First Amendment right to say the things that he said on the podcast. And he claims that he was pretending to be a fictional character named Dr. Narcan. You know what they always do. Oh, it was a joke. Shut up. Shut up. People, there's more of them like him in this male-dominated field, yo. There's more of these guys. I know it's spooky, but it is what it is. Uh, to think that to think that an EMT who can do whatever he want to do or somebody in the medical field and in such an exigent circumstance to think that he won't say, you know what, let me just let him die. Let me let her die. If you don't think they'll do that to you. You're in the twilight zone. You in Peter Pan land, yo. All you could do is hope and pray that they get your peoples there, man. You know what I mean? That's all you can do. You got, and, and hope that, that you get a good EMT who's going to do their job to the best of their ability and get your peoples to their hospital. Now, what I'm saying is many EMTs are racist. The study proves it, and people like this guy got friends. It is what it is. If you talk to a good EMT who's honest and truthful, they'll tell you. Just like I say, talk to a good person in law enforcement. See what they say. Even a white one. See what they tell you. Well, you got people out here, oh, no, it ain't about rape. What? You want to tell me? I mean, shut up. Now, it's very sad the fact that being in an EMT is much more dangerous than being in a hospital a lot of times. When you're transported to these hospitals from an EMT, you at the complete mercy of the EMT. You are sitting up. Very vulnerable position. An EMT can always act out on their feelings Back in that truck, like this bonehead, kneecap head racist right here at McNabb and do what they want to do and not get in trouble for it. Thankfully, this guy went on a podcast, you know, expressing his religion and they found out about him. Not all of them are going to do that. Now, I know people say, what's the solution to this? What can we do? First thing I think that our people we need to do is focus, focus on trying to stay out of these EMTs and ambulances for things that we that we can just do to better ourselves, cutting down on sugar, fried foods, all these carbohydrates, cigarette liquor. You know, a lot of times these emergency calls, when you see our people's getting these ambulances, EMTs, that's what it's usually for. High blood sugar, things like that, passing out, not drinking water, eating too many fried foods, obesity, smoking too many cigarettes, drunk, doing these other things. We got to stay out of these EMTs for the BS, for things that we can do right at home or within ourselves to correct our health, to stay out of there. You get in there for high blood sugar because you done ate, you know what I mean, a Swiss roll. What's wrong with you? And a beer. You done ate seven butterscotch crimpets and drank a purple drink, a purple soda. Now you want an EMT knowing you weren't supposed to have that. You know what I mean? So that's one way we can stay out of these EMTs where we sit in ducks. 
you know, we're not going to be able to avoid the EMTs all, all the time. There are real emergencies, car accidents, things like that, shooting, stabbing. But this is one way I believe the majority of our people get into EMTs for these reasons. Another one is we just got to, you know, try to push and recruit to, to recruit. We got to try to recruit more black youth into becoming EMTs. I, I barely see any black ones. I mean, I know it's some, but this is something we got to do as people. You know what I mean? Another thing we got to do, people, is you got to pay attention when you see something going on in the medical field, whether it be in an ambulance or the hospital. When your people's in the hospital, they get in the ambulance. If you see something, you know, just don't be sitting here letting these doctors or these baby, these baby doogie houses come in and, and, and um, uh, uh, intellectually bully you. You see these little doctors coming in, 14 years old. You're like, who is you? Oh, I'm here. I'm sitting. So you the doctor? You know what I mean? Don't let them just tell you anything. Ask questions. You know what I mean? Ask them. Even if you don't understand, show them that you are somebody who's going to ask them. Just so you, they know, okay, I know he got such and such. She got such and such. They be coming here. They be ch- asking questions. You know what I mean? That's what you need. That's what we, we, we have to do more of. Ask these people questions when they're doing things. Don't just don't let your people sit up in there all twisted up looking and you know it looked like something wrong and they come at you with some old medical excuse that's stupid when they could have did something different. You know what I'm saying? Another thing, people, don't go into these medical facilities acting aggressive, sometimes ignorant, yelling at these medical people. You yelling at you yelling at the CNA, you yelling at the nurse, you acting a certain way, you acting out. And then you leave your peoples there overnight. What do you think they're doing? What do you, you think they're doing to your peoples? So you acted out. You did all this. A lot of times I think that people who go in and do this, though, they don't really care too much about their people who are there. they just a visitor. I'm going to go up there and see such and such. And they come in talking all this stuff, acting kind of loud to the CNA, the nurse. And, they, and then they're just going to leave the peoples there who are going to have to pay for how they acted or what they did if this person is vindictive and want to get back at you because they do it all the time, yo. These nurses in CNA, they, they do that. They do that. Don't do that, yo. Because some people play get back. Don't go in there talking slick and hard to these people. Some people will get back at your peoples. All right, y'all. Easy.